Hello, and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast, and I am your host, Samuel. In this podcast, I interview top medical sales reps and leading medical sales executives across the entire country. And it doesn't matter what medical sales industry, from medical device to pharmaceutical to genetic testing to diagnostic lab, you name it, you will learn how to either break into the industry, be a top 5% performer within your role in sales, or climb the corporate ladder. Welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Medical Sales Podcast. I'm your host, Samuel. And today we have with us another special guest, and he goes by the name of Rob Shiar Mataro. Now, my personal opinion is every episode, every guest we have on this show is special because they're bringing value and they're bringing you a perspective, information, and even a lifestyle that's going to give you that much more on what it's going to mean if you decide to take that step into medical sales, or if you're already here, how you navigate through your career and be whoever you want to be. But this episode, I'm going to put a little extra on it because Rob is an amazing individual. He was a diagnostic sales rep, so a diagnostic sales rep in the cancer space. And he was a sales rep in that space for four years, then gets cancer, has that experience, and goes back into the field. I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to give it away, but this is a very powerful episode. We spend a lot of time on perspective. We spend a lot of time with that story. And I promise you right now, you're going to learn something that you probably haven't learned before. You're going to hear things that you haven't heard before, and you're going to have an appreciation for how your life can look. As always, we do our best to bring you guests that are doing things differently in the medical cell space. So I really do hope you enjoy this interview. Hey, Rob, how are we doing today? I'm doing great, Samuel. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. Absolutely no complaints. Why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name is Rob Shimatero. I am a an account manager for Exact Sciences in the diagnostic sales rab, realm. I'm also a cancer survivor, and I'm uh, very thankful to be on the show with you today to talk a little bit about my career and my life experiences. More importantly, Ooh, I mean, we got we got a lot to dive into. I'm excited, um, but we're gonna take it step by step. Let's talk specifically about your role in in the diagnostic space. You know. People are getting more and more familiar. Hopefully, if, you, if anyone's been listening to this podcast for any amount of time, they're starting to get a better understanding on what's out there. And you have medical device sales, you have pharmaceutical sales, you have biotech sales, and you have this uh, diagnostic sales. Please share with the audience, what exactly is diagnostic sales? Yeah, there are, I mean, there are different categories underneath it, but I think for me, and I started in pharmaceutical sales like many people do. Uh, what drew what drew me to the diagnostic side was the ability to play a bit a bit more of a role on the front end for the patient. So the ability to offer products that could potentially detect disease um, and and maybe even help patients avoid treatment instead of necessarily selling treatment. So I think when I think about diagnostic sales, that's that's really the difference, right? Is where where we're playing a role in that journey for the patient, trying to help bring products forward as diagnostic companies that diagnose or uncover disease early on and, and guide treatment decisions. I love it. I love it. You know, you make, you make, you give all the other things that are trying to happen with healthcare a chance to work because like you said, you're finding out early and you're getting on top of it. Um, so with diagnostic, with your position then, what, what's the setup like? Do you have a team? Or is it autonomous? Who, what type of people are you calling on, on doctors? Are you calling on more hospital staff? Are you calling on clinic founders? You know, talk to us a little bit about what the landscape looks like. Yeah. And, I, and when I talk, you know, this is really based on my personal experience. You know, it's not representative of exact sciences, the, you know, these views and opinions truly are mine, but I'll share the landscape for diagnostic sales um, and, and what that looks like uh, and, and give a little bit about what my specific path through it was like. So yeah, similar to a pharmaceutical rep, you'll have a category of providers that you're calling on consistently, right? Those may be primary care providers. They may be specialists. It really depends on the disease state that your product is hoping to help diagnose or uncover, right? So, you know, in an instance where you're selling a product that looks for a type of cancer, um, it would really be whether or not that cancer is is screened for at the primary care level or the specialist level, and that would determine who you're calling on. So when I was a rep, you know, I was calling on primary care providers quite a bit. And then as my career progressed and uh, became manager and managed reps that called on primary care providers and then began um, a, an account management 
level of experience, began working with health systems, partnering with different specialty divisions that that played in the different roles of the of the cancers that that we focus on. So really it's it's a mixed bag. Um, but the idea is to partner or at least to begin to work with the providers that are looking for that disease um, at the ground level, right? So, and that varies by disease state, by product state. Got it, got it. And, and, and it's safe to say though, that your primary uh, target are oncologists. Actually, no. So it's okay. an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So really by the, by the time a patient gets to an oncologist, right, they're, they're going to be treated um, for whatever cancer they have. I mean, I, that was certainly my experience. Uh, but the majority of diagnostic companies are really working with providers who are hoping to weed patients out or elevate them to oncology or whatever specialist needs to treat that disease. So a lot of times the products used for diagnostics or screening are used at a primary care level. So it is primary care physicians oh, wow. that are looking in the general population, right, to help determine if if there's disease there. And if there is, then we know we need to elevate them to specialists um, and so on and so forth. Wow. You said you were in pharma before, so you've sold drugs. Um, and yeah. now, you oh, sell, yeah. now you sell tests. What's the biggest difference? The story, truly. You know, you're you are, I believe the best representatives tell great stories and, and you have to tell stories about the people that your product supports. And I think that what diagnostic sales gave me the opportunity to do was to begin to shift that story from managing the symptoms of patients to really playing a role in in shaping the experiences that they have in their life because uh, diagnostic products can change at what point patients discover they have a disease and that impacts everything about what their future looks like. So I think that's it is the story to me was one that was easier to connect to just because it it allowed me to it allowed me to feel like I was I was really shaping a patient's experience uh, more so than just uh, maybe symptom management. Okay. Now we're going to get into it. You know, you, you've had cancer um, and you, you beat cancer. Um, and, and I, I can only imagine that being a cancer rep and then getting cancer and then going back to being a cancer rep, I can only imagine that it was, it was just different, man. I mean, it had to, no. Great for, great for career progression. Let me tell you, you know, like <laughs> if you're at a cancer company, go ahead, get cancer. It'll really help you climb the ladder. No. Um, it was bizarre, you know, truly. Uh, I, I had spent about four years working um, in the cancer space before my diagnosis. Right. And uh, yeah, talk about a, a, an odd whirlwind, right? You spend virtually every day talking all day to providers about cancer. And then you're staring at a provider and they're, they're telling you that you have cancer. I mean, it's, it was weird. Profound. So, so what I, wanna, I, wa I want you to share is, you know, I want to know how were you selling before before you had cancer and then when you got back into the field what what how did you do it differently yeah it's a great question i think before cancer like many great representatives do right i would i would focus on the stories that that the that the product could tell that the company had designed for us to tell using the data, right? And and those are powerful. Like you have to sell with data, uh, obviously in the medical space, or else your your product has no uh, validity. But the biggest change for me afterwards was the emotional connection to the patient experience. And I wouldn't always necessarily have to share that I went through it in order for it to be impactful. No matter what product you're selling, you know, medical device. Uh, biotech or pharmaceutical, there is a real patient experience that's being impacted if your product is used appropriately and has the the outcome that's intended. And I think connecting to the emotional side of that for the patient um, and for the provider too, because they're the ones having those uncomfortable conversations with patients consistently, man, it really changes the dynamic from you being in there and pushing a product to really discussing real life experiences of people. And, and when you can do that, uh, it starts to feel a lot less like sales and a lot more like people helping people. I can only imagine. So, you know, take us through it, you know, take us back to, first of all, let's go way, way back and let's start with what did you want to do coming out of college? And then we're going to go through the whole thing, but let, let's, let's go through it slowly. So what did you want to do coming out of college? How about that? Beautiful little Sicilian boy born in 1990. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. Cue the music. Cue the music. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Kill. Get them off there. So in 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 school, I was uh, uh, two years in college. I was still planning on being a history teacher because I had zero direction and was in college mostly because I wanted to have a good time, right? And mm-hmm. I was fortunate enough to come across uh, an opportunity for a summer internship with a company called the Campus Special. Have you heard of these guys? I haven't. No. I really cool. So. They developed a model that was meant to be a competitor to all of the school magazines that sold advertising space. Okay. So the campus special was just a coupon book, mm-hmm. but it gave uh, college students the opportunity to spend a summer traveling around their college town and selling small businesses ad space in this coupon book and website and app. Okay. And uh, I mean, I was completely raw. I'd never sold anything in my life outside no, that's of maybe. the best kind of sales job to get considering you never sold anything in your life. Insane. And I had no idea the value of it at the time. So I hopped on board, right? It was all 100% commission based, like so many of those great first sales jobs are, you know? So you're only getting, you're only eating if you're, if you're selling right. um, and hit the road and learned a, learned a ton, sold ad space for them uh, one summer. And they had a wonderful, I forget what they called it, but it was a program where if you if you stuck with them through a summer and you were successful, then they put you into like a sales placement program. So I did that the summer after my sophomore year. So I still had a couple of years left of college and they followed me through to the end and they helped me get my first sale job out of school, which was at ADP. So, you know, okay. most of us get paid by ADP, automatic data processing. Right. Um, so I sold payroll was my first job out of school and the campus special really, really hooked that up for me. Heard by Chegg. I'm sure you've heard of Chegg. Yes, um, yes. books, I think, uh, they do like selling school books, but that's, I think that's what ended up happening with the campus special, but they were my start and they were, a uh, an awesome, small little kind of, you know, grassroots organization that was teaching college kids how to sell. Wow. Wow. So, so, so you're at ADP. What was, what light went on that said, but I need to be in, in a medical sales environment, not, not, not this sales environment. I mean, I was walking into every business imaginable, crying in parking lots in my car in between. And I was like, there's got to be something more, right? There's got to, there's got to be something more than business there's to business, be Samuel. Um, <laughs> um, and thankfully, I mean, ADP is really well known around the country as a, a wonderful starter sales program. So about a year in, um, I began being contacted by recruiters from a bunch of different industries. Uh, you know, once you're, I, I, one thing I'll advocate for always is to maintain your professional profile online on LinkedIn. It seems so insignificant, but there are very, very talented, motivated recruiters constantly looking for sales talent. So whenever I have younger sales reps or newer sales reps reach out looking for opportunities, I'll say, man, connect with as many recruiters online as you can, because they are just a wealth of information and they have positions to fill. So I started to meet a few of them just through inquiries online and got exposed to a couple different industries, did interview with medical device as well as pharmaceutical and chose to go the the pharmaceutical route. Got it. Got it. Wow. Yeah. And I work for Daiichi Sankyo. I don't know if I said that, but I'm fine sharing that. So I did, I, I was, I was in sales for two years at, at Daiichi. Okay. Okay. So now, now, you know, I, I want to, I want to go through with you and I know you speak on this. Take us there, man. You're, you're doing your job. You're selling. Don't let me, don't let me, I don't even want to set it up for you. Just take us there. Yeah. I well. get to where you were working. You got the diagnosis and just what was the, what were the first thought? Give us the whole story. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I will. Um, so I was about four years into my time with Exact Sciences and uh, really enjoying it, um, having a lot of success as a sales rep. And uh, funny enough, I was about three months, uh, three months removed from being on one of the annual trips. Right, so had had a really good year the year before, and was starting to notice um, that when I was exercising, that I would have really substantial swelling in my left arm you know, to the point where like, we're talking extra, extra vasculature, almost a little discoloration Mm -hmm. for a hot second. I was like, am I finally just truly getting jacked? Right. My whole life, it never happened. Am I finally getting ripped? And that was it. It was not the case. So I, uh, after about putting it off for a few months, I decided to go in and and have that arm checked out. And at that point, I'm just thinking it's an arm issue and they found a DVT. So they found a deep vein thrombosis and blood clot in my superior vena cava on my left side. So I was 28 at the time. That's a pretty bizarre finding for a 28 year old. And, uh, especially one that was, I mean, I was health conscious, clean, pretty clean diet, um, exercise consistently. And my primary care provider thought all those same things. So he recommended that I go see a vascular specialist 
uh, the recommendation or the, the wait time for them at that point was like three and a half months. So they sent me home on a blood thinner on Eloquist. Shout out any of our reps selling Eloquist that are listening. And, uh, and that was it. I was, that was told to go wait. So about 10 to 12 days after I had that doctor's appointment, I was just being consumed by anxiety. Like I knew something more was going on, right? It just didn't feel right to me. I shouldn't have a blood clot. Like this, this can't be as simple as, Hey, you exerted yourself too much at the gym and pinched something. And now there's a blood clot. So I was really struggling in those kind of 10 days and I stepped on the scale um, and it, since I had been at the doctor, I had lost 22 pounds in, in those 10 to 12 what? days. So the 10 to 12 days, you lost 22 pounds. Correct. From the time that just, I went to the doctor. Cause you just weren't hungry or what was going on? I didn't know. So that was a major red flag, right? I mean, you could eat literally nothing for 12 days. You're not going to lose 22 pounds. Right. So I knew that meant something serious was going on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I told my wife, hop in the car, we're going to the ER. Right. So I, I drove to the ER and that day in the ER, they did a CT scan of my chest, um, partially because I, you know, on WebMD, whatever, I was pretty convinced that I had thrown the blood clot and that I was having a pulmonary embolism. That was in my brain, right? I'm like, I'm having chest pain now. It's right. It's got to be that. I'm going right. to drop dead here, right? So they did the CT scan. And on that scan, they actually found a 13 by 12 centimeter, which I thought was a typo at first, uh, mass in my chest. So that's about the size of a softball. Um, and it was, uh, it was pushing on my heart. It was pushing on my lungs. I had pericardial effusion. Um, and you know, obviously I'll never forget the, the doctor's face when he came in the room and said, Hey, you know, you don't, you don't have a pulmonary embolism, but there's a huge mass in your chest. And, uh, you know, being in just my work experience and everything, I mean, I knew what it meant, you know? So that was, that was really tough. It was a crazy day and it happened to be my dad's birthday. So we went to an Italian dinner, Italian restaurant after that, after that yeah, doctor's yeah. appointment, it was just one of the most bizarre experiences, um, that you could ever imagine. But at that point, the beautiful part is you shift focus. You know, it, you would have thought that when I found out that I had cancer, that I would have been consumed by fear and anxiety. But honestly, I felt better because I had been living the last two weeks knowing that something serious was wrong. And I was at this felt like, okay, we have some direction. Right. Um, let's, let's get after it. So they were pretty, they were pretty clear with me that it was most likely an aggressive uh, cancer, obviously they have to do a biop biopsy to stage it and, and to get the subtype. So it ended up being non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay. um, my subtype, and there are hundreds of subtypes. I think there's actually about a hundred subtypes of non-Hodgkin's. Mm -hmm. Um, some are curable, some are not. So yeah. some, some you live with forever, right? If you're lucky enough to survive. Uh, so that was a, another part of the waiting game that was really stressful was finding out exactly what subtype I had, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mine, mine ended up being a type of diffuse large B cell, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a very aggressive subtype called primary mediastinal. So that tumor was in my mediastinum, thankfully yeah. hadn't spread elsewhere. It was not in my lymph nodes. It wasn't in any other uh, tissue. So aggressive sounds bad, but actually in non-Hodgkin's, it, it's usually a positive when it comes to treatment outcomes. So they, uh, they have a chemo regimen um, followed by radiation. That's a pretty standard of care treatment. And they were determined to get me started on that pretty quickly. So I want to say about 10 days after that diagnosis, I began chemotherapy, pretty intensive chemo regimen where I was on, uh, an infusion for 24 hours a day for five days straight. Um, and then I would have two weeks off and I did that six times. So six rounds of chemo, um, scan over, after over, over what period of time, about six months, a little bit less. So the diagnosis was late uh, late July, early August. And I completed my final round of chemo December 13th. So really all in all about a five months, a treatment a month. Yep. Just about. Yep. Um, and, and it would have actually been a little bit quicker. We there's, you can have delays if the treatment knocks your white blood cell count down and, and it did for me one round. So, um, yeah, it, really bizarre, even for it to be that, that short of a time frame, right? Like looking back on it, I was really only undergoing treatment for about five months. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had scans throughout. So after mm -hmm. about two rounds, I had a pre pretty solid indication that the treatment was working, working well. Mm -hmm. Um, and thankfully by the end of those six rounds, uh, I was uh, determined to be in remission. So oh. no sign of the cancer. And that left me with an interesting decision. So, uh, my local oncology team, suggested that I, uh, do radiation following the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Um, 
I was a little uncomfortable with that because of the proximity to my heart. Sure. Uh, the, the tumor was right, right in the middle of my chest. Right. Sure. So I was, I was thankful and, and blessed to connect with one of the leading researchers on my subtype. Um, he was out of NIH in Baltimore nice. and, uh, yeah, I know. Great guy. I mean, took the time completely pro bono to like, look at my, look at my reports and, and get back to me and, and I'll be thankful to him forever. And he said yeah, he wouldn't do it. You know, at my age, he was like, you had a, such a great response to chemo, um, that I think you have a higher chance of, of dealing with major issues and, and potential fatality from radiation side effects in 20 years versus the cancer coming back. So I made that tough decision not to do the radiation against the recommendation of my local team. Um, and again, that was one where making that decision, I knew there, there was never probably going to be a, a way that I would know if that was the right decision or not. You know, obviously if it comes back, I'll always wonder if it was the wrong decision. Um, but thankfully, so that was 2019. So I have been in remission for four years as of this past December, and I feel great, uh, physically and mentally. And that is not something that I could have said, uh, for quite a while. So I'm thankful. Oh, that's amazing. Um, you know, when I, when I hear your your story, I can't help but imagine your, you know, let, let's go back to that time. And I can't help but think when you're, when you're going through this, I want to believe that you probably show up a couple of different ways. Uh, some people show up just defeated. Like, I can't believe this. Some people show up, you know, shocked and stunned and they, they just paralyzed. And some people go immediately into the fight. Uh, I want to believe that at some point you've got to go into that fight, but I assume there's a, there's a, you have to gradually get there. Talk to us a little bit about how it was for you. Were you able to just, you know, what were the stages for you? I guess that's what I'm really trying to ask. I was a mess, dude. Good days and bad days, right? I think you captured that well. There are times where you feel like I'm doing this thing, I'm fighting it, right? And then there's setbacks and they don't even have to be substantial physical setbacks, right? It can be something minor that just makes you feel so defeated. And while that time frame was only five months, I mean, it felt like years, right? It, it Going through chemotherapy, it not only does it strip you of a lot of the physical attributes that you really truly use internally to, to create an image for yourself, right. it changes changes everything about how you think about yourself, mm -hmm. how you feel about life, right? Like I, I was always someone that had a pretty positive, uh, rosy disposition, you know, and now I'm faced with this idea that my mortality's very much so in question, right? And, you know... You have to rally. You, you have to find a way to push through it. And I think that it was easier to do that while the fight was still going on. So when you're going through treatment, you know, there's so much going on. You're on these physical highs and lows from the cocktails of drugs along with steroids and whatnot, um, sure. that it's, it's easy to kind of put your head down and just look at that finish line. And I think I told myself throughout that process that, Hey, just, just get to that finish line. Right. And then we can start getting our life back. And what I didn't even begin to realize was that once I crossed that finish line and reached remission, the real battle was waiting. I mean, wow. learning, learning how to live again, learning how to function again, how to not be an anxious mess, scanning my body internally every five seconds of every single day, feeling my neck, mm. feeling my mm. lymph nodes, mm. drove myself to the ER so many times, Samuel, wow. like, I, can't even, I can't even tell you. So it, it you asked a great question and there's no easy answer to it. You know, for anyone that's going through treatment, God, my heart is with you. Um, just keep going. That's really all that matters. There were days I broke down and cried. There were days I felt like a warrior that could withstand anything. And, and you're going to have both of those. Now, did you have, you know, what was the support like for you specifically? Yeah. You mean like family wise and stuff? Everything wise. I don't know if, you know, maybe family was there, maybe uh, it was yeah. groups, maybe it was your friends. Talk to us a little bit about, I guess, you know, of course, support has to play an important role, but I yeah. want to believe it probably looks a little bit different for everyone. So what was that support like for you? Yeah, I'm happy to share. First, I'll say my main takeaway from a question like this is that you really have to be your own champion because I think let's first talk about medical team support. So when I first went through that diagnostic period where they un uncovered my cancer, I was with a, a certain health system and I really didn't like how my care was being handled. I didn't feel like I, they had got me in to see a specialist quick enough. Once the mass was discovered, I, I realized that there had been uh, tests that were done at my initial primary care appointment that were never reviewed. So I, I, Hey, shout out to the medical sales, right? I had relationships with physicians because of my career, thankfully. So I actually changed health systems. Um, 
And that's, you know, uh, maybe that's part of me being blessed by having worked in the field, but I, you really have to be your own advocate here because there were timelines of getting me in to start treatment, getting me in to see a specialist that would have taken longer had I not advocated for myself. So that's one thing I'll say is if, if you're, if something doesn't feel right, if you're not getting calls back quick enough, if they tell you, you can't get in to see somebody for a certain amount of time and you're like, I have cancer, right? Or I, I'm dealing with this disease. I need to get treatment. Be your own advocate, make the phone call, make someone feel uncomfortable. It's okay. You have to do it for yourself because otherwise it's too easy to just be a number to them. And it doesn't mean it's not their fault. They just have sure. tons of things it's on their plate. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. number one. Number two, I'm blessed with an amazing support system. So um, my wife, Jamie, she was there with me every step of the way. I have a, a, a wonderful, very close knit group of friends that I've grown up with that, that really, you know, embraced this with me. So I was, I had a revolving door of people in my life. Um, I will say all of those things, um, aside, it, it's, it's an incredibly lonely experience. I mean, I doesn't matter if it's the most, the person I respected most in this world or, uh, one of my best friends or, or just someone off the street, you know, when you're experiencing something as profound as a cancer battle and the mental struggle that comes along with it, I found very quickly that nothing anyone said made me feel better mm. with the slight exception of, of people that had lived it. So one piece of advice I would give, and it's not just about cancer. If you're going through something, sure. um, any sort of trauma, hard times, find support. It, it, it can be therapy. It doesn't have to be therapy. It can be support groups, connecting with other cancer survivors and other people going through the battle. One of the beautiful um, parts of social media is that we can connect with people far away very easily now. So I joined online support groups. Um, I would go back and read when I was feeling something that felt off Samuel, I would just go and type it into the search bar. Right. And three yeah. years ago, someone in the group had posted uh, a similar comment oh. and a bunch of people had responded. Come uh. on. And it's like, you know, those, 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 that may seem insignificant, but when you're having those little mental battles 20 times a day and you can Everything. get a little relief, man, every little, every little bit helps. So yeah. I tell people right now, you know, if, if you're going through something, find some other people that are living it and, and, and get that support. So that's fantastic. That's beautiful. You know, I, I, I uh, you know, I, I told you that my, my mother had a uh, diagnosed in 08 and went to full remission. God bless her. Yeah, and I love um, it. You know, there's 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 this automatic sympathy that you garner when going through something like that i assume um and and i've heard people say they they didn't mind it and i've heard people say they, just, they couldn't stand it talk to us a little bit about about uh what, what was your position on that it's weird yeah you got you have to take control of it i think and and that takes a little bit of time right when it's when it's early on there's going to be pity. You just, you, people can't help it, man. You know, I, I can show you a photo of me. I promise you right now, you would feel pity when you right. see it. It's I, just, I, there's believe no it. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing you can do about it, you know? And I, I, I hear the same things from survivors in the groups I'm in that they can't stand the way that people look at them or talk to them or the way they make them feel with certain questions. I'll, I will just say as a reminder, man, it is, you are the one that's going through the hardest thing, but it's uncomfortable for people. People don't know how to react in a situation like that, especially if they hadn't been through it. So, you know, give them a little grace. And eventually, I promise you, you'll have the chance to to reclaim the narrative and and, and start rebuilding your image. I never thought I'd be here looking like a biker in front of you guys, bald hey, and bearded, but here I am, baby. No hey, more hair on the head. On. I got the beard going. <laughs> like, you write your own narrative again eventually, Amen I promise. Amen to that with a capital A. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll share this. You know, I... I I had a scare. Um, I had a really bad, just I had stomach issues uh, two years ago. Okay. And, and when I say I had stomach issues, I mean, I couldn't hold food down for three days straight. The doctors couldn't explain that. I went to the ER. I was in the ER three times. Finally, they, they did some, you know, searching down there. And the, and the, 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 the fear was, you know, this guy might have uh, stomach cancer. Um, the doctor was not sure I had to really get into it and figure it out. And, and I remember there was about a weekend and maybe two or three days that we just didn't know. And I kept thinking, okay, what, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do about like, how do I make this work for me? You know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in no matter what life throws at you, there's always lemonade to make. How am I going to make some lemonade? You know, what can I do? And I started thinking about, you know, what do I want to accomplish? And, you know, should I rush to try to accomplish things that I've always wanted to accomplish that much faster? Or maybe I should just throw my hands up and just become a, a hedonistic nomad and just do whatever. Or maybe I should, and I just would go through all these different thoughts. What was it like for you? Yeah. 
all iterations of that, if we're being completely <laughs> honest. So, you know, in those, in those periods, and I, I, to be honest, it lasted probably 18 months to two years post uh, remission before I really got a good grasp on mm. being in a good place mentally again and, and functioning sure. without, without constant anxiety. Right. Of sure. course I was still fine. I was still productive at work. I still maintained my relationships. I didn't burn things down, but I was struggling every single day, probably for 18 months, I would say before it started to really get better. And I love that you asked this question because it's part of my path through it. And it's part of what I advocate for, for anyone that's been through so many of the, the miserable suffering that this world can offer. Uh, and I tried the hedonistic approach first. There was a time <laughs> in early 2021 where I spent thousands of dollars on the most expensive bourbons and I was just yeah. sucking them down. I mean, wow. I was, yeah. that was my new thing. I was a bourbon taster and I was wow. not paying consistently. Um, and I will say that uh, I would not recommend that approach, even though you may go through it. And what really, truly ended up helping me regain um, control of my life was anchoring to the aspects of what I had been through that I could control. There's a lot that you can't when in cancer. That's just the reality of it. But you can control uh, what you do with your life moving forward and the aspects of your life that are tied to disease, maybe not necessarily cancer, but there's sure. certainly manageable disease out there. You can impact your chances of getting heart disease. You can impact your chances of getting certain types of cancer. You can impact your chances of being obese or having type two diabetes. So I really anchored to knowledge, consistency, um, self-discipline, and I began to uh, read a bunch about health. And I mean, obviously I had a base of knowledge from sure. working in the field, but not really about what our lifestyle and diets mean for us. And that became my thing. And that doesn't have to be your thing, right? But I think once you've been through something really traumatic, you have to have a purpose, man. There's got to be a purpose that that you're pushing forward. Some people really anchor to helping others, kind of like you have here with this beautiful podcast and your business. Thank you. And helping others is a part of mine too. You know that. I love working with people that have been through things. But for me, in my day-to-day, -day, it really became about my health. Um, so I rarely drink anymore. Um, there's a lot of bourbon down here in this basement that I could <laughs> share with you if you came by. So it's, it's not like I never do it, but uh, it's very rare. Sure. Um, and I spend a lot of time really thinking and learning and continuing to gain knowledge um, about different uh, ways that our life and our diets and our and our decisions impact our health. And that's become a big passion for me. So I've had the chance to meet some really well-researched and, and brilliant people through those conversations. And I really try to live them. You know, I, I really advocate to survivors to move, to, to do some resistance training because strength is so important as we age and you lose a lot of it when you go through treatment. So you don't have to necessarily be a bodybuilder, but mm -hmm. do, you know, do some things, do some resistance training, build some strength as, as you start to come out of treatment, don't push yourself too hard, but, but take those baby steps back. Um, I'm a big advocate of eliminating processed foods and refined sugar as much as you can, you know, eat a whole food diet as much as possible, right? It's uh, little things like that, you know, that I think make all the difference and really helped me be, it, not only to become my focus, but it helped me feel better physically, get my head into a clearer space and give me, give me a path forward out of this, man. And I think that's what you need, you know, even if treatment goes great for you, um, like mine did go well. You got to find out like, what is, what is this life post cancer for me? It's got to have a purpose. And that's going to be, that can be tough to figure out. So what was your purpose pre-cancer and what was your purpose post cancer? My purpose pre-cancer was happiness. I just thought I was chasing being happy, traveling time with friends. Those are, those are great things. Still, living living right? in the moment. It sounds living, like. in, living in the moment, right? I, I was constantly in the search of whatever would make me happy. Um, and now I want to be useful. Uh, that's my purpose now. I want to be useful to myself with my health. I want to be useful to my family. I want to be useful to other survivors. I want to be useful to my company. Mm -hmm. um, and that's shifted my perspective and how I how I view myself internally 10 times over, man. Like there are going to be times in life that you're not happy. I hate to break that to you. <laughs> that goes to, it goes for everybody on here, whether you go through a battle like me and your mom or not. Mm -hmm. um, you, if you can learn to set the barometer for yourself around being useful, uh, man, it becomes a really fun opportunity to continue to build usefulness through different ways and happiness comes with some of those. So I would say that's been a big change for me and I, I don't have anything figured out. You know, I really don't, I'm still, I'm learning every day, man. And that's, that's part of the beauty of this. That's amazing. Are you, are you a God fearing man? Of course. Catholic school. 
12 years. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, I'll give you the whole history. Okay. So, so <laughs> you know, I would think that with a, with a, with an experience like this, where your, your mortality is threatened, your relationship with, with your higher power just hits a new level. Is that, was that true for you? And if you can share, you know, what, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, it wasn't what I thought it would be. Um, I did, I did pray a lot when I was going through it. And I feel like in many ways it strengthened my relationship with my spirituality. Sure. But I do think that it also, let me frame it this way. In my search for coping with my experience, I really anchored to some different philosophies. And the philosophy of the Stoics is one that I, I really enjoy and it still brings me peace today. Mm -hmm. So while my relationship with, uh, I want to say spirituality, because I don't like to say one religion or another, like I don't want anyone to feel discouraged. And I don't think, I think the presence of religion is less important than having belief itself, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, my relationship there, obviously when you go through something like that and you feel like you relied on your spirituality, it can grow. And it did in ways, but, but what it really taught me was that I can choose to frame the way that I go through experiences. And that takes internal work. And that's work that you have to put in for the rest of your life. But as I began to learn about these different philosophies, I mentioned stoicism, what it really helped me to realize was that whether it's through prayer to the higher power that you believe in or through internal reflection and intentional effort every day, when you go through something traumatic in your life or just the stresses of being a human every day, working in the medical sales industry, hey, to break it to you guys, there's a little bit of stress in this industry sometimes. Just a little, called, just a little. It's called, it's called quota. <laughs> um, you can frame mm -hmm. how you feel how you process those emotions and how you react. And that was something I had never spent any time on thinking about when I, before cancer. And maybe that's not because of cancer. Maybe it's just because the kid had to grow up at some point, right? I'm still, still, still trying to get there. But, um, I think that was the biggest change for me is learning that I can truly be intentional about when I experience something, I'm going to feel all kinds of different feelings. I can process those and choose to react how I, how I want to, instead of just allowing myself to have an emotional overreaction to all of the things that happened to me. So I know that's a weird way to answer your question about God, no, <laughs> but no, that's, it's not, it's not weird. It's, it's, it's real. It's real. Go ahead. Yeah. That's where it took me. It really did. So it taught, it taught me that whether it's through spirituality or through searching internally for those, um, philosophies that, that bring me peace, I gotta, I gotta own that part of my life. I have to own how I handle stressful situations and I have to intentionally work on getting better at them or else I, what can I expect, right? I can expect to have the same or, or worse results in, in those kind of situations. So then, I mean, that's, that's beautiful what you just shared. And it makes me think, you know, so now cancer is in the rear view, life is in front of you, uh, resourcefulness and being useful is the new mission. And I want to say you almost developed a little superpower in being able to have anything happen. Slow down for a moment and process how you want to step into it. Give us some examples of what that looks like for you now. Yeah, it's it's intentionality in, in so many different ways, right? It, in leadership roles in our careers, it's looking at a situation and speaking last instead of speaking first. It's listening to feedback um, and not having an emotional reaction if it's negative. It's, I mean, one of the most beautiful pieces of perspective from going through something like cancer is almost the insignificance of many of life's great stressors, right? Many of the things that would have driven me only nuts. Imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. And, and that's a gift, man. Like, you know, yeah. that that's the funniest part. And I tell people this all the time is, of course, anytime you go through an experience and you're able to come out on the other side, like there's going to be gifts and there's going to be learnings from it. And that's probably, that's probably one of the most beautiful ones is, is don't let, don't let the little things become the big things. You know, there are very, very few true big things in your life, but I promise you, your health is one of them. And you'll learn that really quickly if you ever get sick. So the blessing that that's given me is it's removed that unnecessary emotion from insignificant things. But what it has done that I still haven't figured out, may, and maybe I never will, right? Is it's give, it's created this I don't want to call it a burden, but it feels like it at times, if I'm being completely honest, of a need to do something more significant with my experience now. You know, I have lived this. I have done 
small things to share my experiences doing one of those right now with you. Um, not that your business is a small thing. This is beautiful, but you know what I'm saying? And now I do feel the constant pressure to not waste this, to not just live that hedonistic way, to not just be great in my career, but to really make a difference in people's lives because I've been given this perspective that many people won't have. And if they do go through something significant, that perspective is very valuable. So that's challenging. And it's something that I struggle with every single day. And I've, I, I'm always working on it and trying different things. And I don't know what that end answer looks like, but that is that search is now a part of me too. So you said, you know, when you described uh, the drive to want to do this um, and, 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 and not waste the the gift that that you have of of being able to 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 do your life the way you want to do it now you said pressure what give us a little bit talk to us a little bit about what you mean by this pressure and, and sound like you said did you say building like mounting pressure so at, as the days go by you're feeling it is it is it in the form of someone saying something is it does it just hit you random like talk to us a little bit about what you, about what that looks like this pressure yeah, it's 100% internal. I, I feel like because of the experiences I've had now through cancer, that I owe more to people. I just do, you know, and maybe that's wrong. I, I think there are times where I try to convince myself I should not feel that way. And I'm probably making myself have less happiness, right? Again, we don't care as much about it anymore. We're trying to be useful. Let's get, let's get, let's stick with 2024's themes. <laughs> okay. But no, I'm being, but I'm being real. Like it's, I do feel it and I don't know how to get rid of it. And it's, I, I think I always felt even before I was sick that I, you know, I wanted to do something greater than just, you know, have a career and build that. Like I wanted to, I wanted to impact people. And that is so, that is so maximized now. Like the way that I feel that because of my experiences, if I go too long without doing something that is working with cancer survivors or impacting potential cancer patients, I really start to feel like, what am I doing? I'm not using my experience, you know, and, and that, that, that is not a good feeling. So I am constantly exploring different ways to use it and I get a lot of utility out of them too. So this isn't just Rob being uh, selfless. Like I, I really truly feel most useful and get a lot of positive utility from, from helping people that it doesn't even have to be cancer, just that are going through things and that are struggling. Um, because I've been there, you know, and it's, there's nothing worse, but I'll tell you, I've been through a lot in life, like sit, sitting in a Tim Hortons at 5 45 AM with a chemo bag, waiting for them to open so I can order some breakfast sandwiches and crush them because the prednisone is making me starving. That sucks, but it's not as bad as the anxiety after when I was unable to, you know, wake up every day, uh, without freaking out. And, and I know that people are living those things right now. And that's, I'm so motivated to help those people. And that can feel, uh, that can feel like a lot of pressure. Sure. You know what though, I'd like to say to that specifically to that is I almost feel like if, if that is weighing on you, um, it's supposed to be there. And, and if that's, if you're developing this sentiment, if I need to do something about this feeling that I have, I think that's exactly what you're supposed to do. And, um, the, the more you continue to step into it, the clearer it's going to get. And, and of course, the more fulfilled you'll start to feel. Yeah, I think you're right. I already feel it. I feel it when I, I feel it when I do things that, that go in that direction. So I have no doubt about it. And I'm very blessed. I'm very blessed to have a career where I get to feel like I'm, like I'm making an impact on, on patients. So uh, thankful for that, but I have no doubt that, uh, that there's more to come, you know, for me. Yeah. I want to switch gears a little bit because you shared, a, you shared a nugget with us. Oh boy. Um, not only did you, uh, champion life for yourself you champion life for a new life please share with us what i'm talking about i won't spoil it i'm not going to give it away yeah we we hopped on and we were just catching up at the beginning of our conversation here before we went we went live and i shared with samuel that we continue to go through the process of ivf to to have kids because of my cancer journey so i'm, I'm very blessed and thankful to have a, a little two and a half year old son Ooh. uh sunny and um we are, we are trying to have more kids, but that is something that's been very complicated by cancer too. So when people talk about the reverberating effects of something like cancer, it's so hard to quantify the impact it has on you, on your family, on people that love and care about you, right? I mean, those, those webs spread really wide. Um, and one area that's been really profound in my life, um, 
and, and unfortunately this is much harder on my wife than it is on me is just the ability to have kids naturally right and uh, and because we're not able to do that very thankful i had a good oncology team that did have me uh, freeze sperm before i went through tr treatment so we do have options and we're able to go through them um but they're very arduous and expensive and really hard on her and Sure. nothing's guaranteed in those, right? We've been through many without, without any, any success. So, uh, thankfully we got our little guy, right? That's the, that's the, the beautiful, most important part of it all. But it's, it's just a reminder, right? That there are, there are so many aspects of this journey that many people probably don't think about and, and your life will continue to be affected by what you've been through. But man, I'll tell you, we could talk about it all day long at, at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm just so thankful to be able to be here, to be able to have this conversation with you. Like those struggles, they're, they're tough, but, uh, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because uh, it means I get the chance to, to live and experience more here. Amen to that. On that note, is there anything you'd like to share with the audience? You know, uh, there's, there's a lot of people listening and I'll, and I'll get, and I'll set the, I'll set the, I'll set the stage. So there's people that want to get into the industry. There's people that are in the industry and there's people leading the way. And then there's people that just want to listen to two people discussing real life matters, uh, like we are today. So what would you like to share, if anything, with, with the audience? Yeah, I know that the majority of your audience is either in medical sales or interested in getting into medical sales. And I'll just say one of the best parts about selling in this industry is the ability to champion for people. So, you know, I was an example today of a of a patient that could have benefited from some future diagnostic test that will probably um, exist at some point. And certainly from a drug that already did exist or else I wouldn't be here. Right. So I'm a big believer in modern medicine because I would not be alive without it. My advice to you would be if you get a chance to interview for a position in this industry or you get your first job in this industry or you're trying to climb the ladder in this industry, make it about the people. It's really easy in any kind of sales to focus on the product. But one of the beautiful parts of medical sales is that you're impacting people's lives. You're impacting patients' lives. You're impacting providers' lives. Um, and you're impacting people that you work with's lives. One of the quickest ways to make sure you don't climb at a company is to not be a positive contributor to the culture on your own team. Man, make it about the people. Make it about the people that are closest to you at work. Make it about the people you're serving with your products. Um, and make it about the people that ultimately use those products to improve their lives. And if you can tell those stories, you will go far. Mm, mm. Couldn't have said that better, Rob. Uh, all right. We're going to go into the lightning round. Are you ready? I'm terrified, <laughs> but let's do it. Let's do it. You got, I'm going to ask you four questions. You got less than 10 seconds to answer. Oh, boy. First question. Here we go. What is the best book you've read in the last six months? Outlive by Dr. Peter Atia. It's all about health and wellness and longevity. It's an absolute must read. So much wealth of information, all research back. Dr. Peter Atia, Outlive. I'm reading it right now. I'm Are reading you? it right now. I'm like, I think I'm, I think I'm uh, not, I'm a little, I'm almost halfway, but man, I'm, I'm fascinated. My sister, she turned me on to that. She's a, she's a, a doctor and she turned me on. She's like, you have to read this book. It's all about preventative medicine. You have to read. And I, and I started and you're right, man. It's pretty profound, the stuff in there. He's brilliant. I've read it twice. I'll read it again. It's it, he's so good. That's awesome. Okay. What is the best TV show or movie you've seen in the last six months? Last six months. Um, right now we're watching the newest season of True Detective on HBO. I am a sucker for true crime Is that and murder. show still going? I watched I watched it years ago with With Matt McConaughey. McConaughey. Yeah. It was so awesome. And then I just They kind stopped. of, yeah, Yeah. yeah. I was like, well, yeah, okay. They had a bad season. I think it was season two with like Colin Farrell. Really didn't hit well. Um, No. season three was pretty good. And then they has been off for a few years. So they just brought one back. We don't watch a ton of TV. I hopped in because I loved the first one with McConaughey. This one's really good. Set in Alaska. Super creepy. I'm a big true crime guy. Like that's one of my, what's one of my, uh, dirty little secrets. Like if I'm driving in a long car ride, like I'm listening to some murder or missing person mystery. That's my jam. So this, uh, this one, true detective, really good. Awesome. All right. Best meal. And we want the restaurant. We want the place it was the city and the state. Best meal you've had in the last six months. Chicago, Illinois, uh, Bavette's. It's a little French style bistro. They have a 60 some day uh, dry aged ribeye that's got a crust on it that'll change your life. You get to dip it in salt and pepper. It's one of the best meals on the planet. Bavette's, Chicago, Illinois. I'm sold. I'm, that's happening. <laughs> get there. That, that is going to happen. So many good things on that menu. You have to go.
Okay. My brother lives in Chicago. I go every time I visit. Wow. Okay. And then last question, what's the best experience you've had in the last six months? Man, it's just, it's just time with my little guy. Nothing, nothing too crazy there. Uh, we're, uh, we're doing, we're doing soccer with him right now. So just, you know, getting to watch him not take instruction well and <laughs> terrorize other families. It's, it's a real treat, but uh, no, man, it's, 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 that's it. It's family time. That is awesome. Rob, it has been, it has been an honor spending this time with you today and, and getting to hear your, your perspective on life. Very powerful stuff. Please keep on doing amazing things. We can't wait to keep watching you work. You too. Thank you so much for having me. And that was Rob Shiar Mataro. Wasn't that an amazing story? I mean, to be faced with your own mortality and then to be given that second chance to go back at life. I love when he said just all the nonsense, the things that he used to worry about, the problems, the issues, the concerns, the stressors, and just how little they mean now with this new perspective after going through what he went through. It's powerful. I think perspective and being able to have a situation happen to you, disassociate yourself from it and just understand that this thing happened. It's not bad. It's not good. It just happened. How am I going to manage it? How am I going to step into it? How am I going to work through it? That's where all the magic happens. And clearly Rob had an opportunity to become a true master at it because of his experience. Right now, there are a lot of you listening to this and thinking to yourselves, wow, what if I can be in a position to sell a tool to a provider that allows them to get in front of cancer and literally change someone's life and give them the opportunity to get in front of something that if they weren't able to, could be the end of their life. Well, you already know what I'm going to say. Go visit evarvysuccess.com, fill out an application and schedule some time with an account executive. Learn what you can do to get yourself into that type of position. One thing I want to add, as you go about your day, or night, or whenever you're choosing to listen to this, remember that you can do whatever you want in this life. And all the things that happen to you, you get to decide what they mean, and you get to choose what you're going to do with it. On that note, we do our best to bring you guests who are doing things differently in the medical sales space. So make sure you tune in next week to another episode of the Medical Sales Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And remember, I have a couple programs that show you exactly how to break into the medical sales industry, become a top performing medical sales professional, and also how to masterfully navigate your career to executive level leadership. Check out these programs and learn more at EvolveYourSuccess.com. Stay tuned for more awesome content with amazing interviews.